Anyway, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and thank you for uh, this uh, new week of devotionals, of opportunity to gather around your word in this way. And um, as a community, albeit an online community, but as a community, and um, we can have this, this connection in this way. And so, Father, we um, pray that you would uh, guide us and direct us in this time, that uh, your spirit would find our hearts and our uh, spirits open and receptive to what you would speak to us today. Um, and that we are here to really be molded and shaped and not simply to gain more knowledge, but that we are, are really looking with an expectation to our lives uh, changing and our behavior changing as a result. And so we pray this uh, in, in Christ's name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Still got a little bit of the frog thing going on. And, and, um, but I think, I think I might be on the tail end of it. So, um, hoping, hoping to be, um, yeah. Chapter six. We talked about the, the wine skins and the new cloth being sewn onto the old cloth. You just don't do it. Um, kind of Jesus indication that there's a new thing going on and that maybe we ought to be more in tune to what the spirit is doing and, and not get caught looking in the rear view mirror, not get caught, you know, looking back saying, well, that that's the way we've, we've kind of always done it. And that's, that's a good way of doing it. And, and we kind of miss out on what God is doing. That was kind of, in essence, the, the, what Jesus, what was behind Jesus, um, metaphors that he gave in terms of, uh, uh, the, the new cloth, new garment on the old garment and, uh, new wine into new wine skins. Um, there's a lot of reference to Sabbath here. And again, it is, uh, it seems to be Luke's desire to really um, hammer home this idea that Jesus, his, his messiahship means that he is in control of uh, the law and, and is, and we'll find here today that being in control of law, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And he's going to begin to um, the, the wedge between Jesus and the Pharisees is now beginning to be driven uh, further and further and that the gap is, is growing here to the point where uh, Jesus begins to strategically make some steps in terms of thinking about a uh, future and mission and, and what God called him uh, here uh, to do in his role. So um, Luke continues on with this kind of vague time reference. We don't know how many days have gone. We don't, he's not really interested in that. He's not really interested in chronology, uh, so to speak. Uh, and so he kind of begins these new sections with, you know, this kind of vague reference to a day or a time. And, and this one is no different in that he says on a Sabbath. So on one Sabbath. Um, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. Um, but some Pharisee, but some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? It was not lawful to harvest on the Sabbath. And so this was seen as, as uh, a symbol, symbolically, this was seen as a harvest. You pluck the grain, you rub <clears throat> the the heads in your hand to get the the uh, uh, chaff off the husks off create chaff and then blow um, and and blow the 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 chaff away and there you've got your bare grain well all of that is um, you know uh, reaping um, uh, 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 and the, the whole part process of the harvest. 
um, threshing, reaping, threshing, and winnowing is the winnowing is the is the blowing away of the of the chaff, and so that was seen as as uh, reaping and and uh, harvesting, which was against the law to do, um, at least according to the Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees were all about um, creating this fence or this boundary around the law. And so remember the Sabbath and keep it holy had become this whole system of rules that said you could do this much without going over and, and, and uh, breaking the Sabbath. So it was, they were experts in drawing this line and how close could we walk to the line without going over, um, which is never a, a good thing. And, and so <clears throat> they're, they're now, um, I, you know, I don't know if they're following Jesus around. Um, it, it's, it's possible. There were groups of people that followed him. Um, again, his, his, uh, group of disciples was bigger than, than just the 12. Um, and so, you know, maybe there was a small crowd that kind of followed him around and these Pharisees kind of, um, followed him around as well. Somehow they knew what the disciples had done. And so they, they questioned, and he says, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? So they saw, saw this as a breaking of the Sabbath. So it almost seems like they're following around wanting to find fault, wanting to, you know, um, trick him, um, which, which we get that through this, this whole section that there's this sense that they're trying to set him up so that they can accuse him so that they can ultimately get rid of him. And then, and Jesus, uh, obviously is, is catching on to this, um, in verse three, it says, and Jesus answered them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? Um, he was running from Saul. If you remember the story, um, he was running from Saul. He went to, um, oh, I forget the name of the priest uh, who was at the tabernacle at the time. Um, I forget his name, um, but he went there and, and uh, asked for food. And it says, and he entered the house of God. There's uh, obviously Luke's leaving, or Jesus is leaving a lot out on this. But he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. So he went in to the priest and he says, my my band is here. And, and if you remember the story, the priest said, well, have your men been kept from women because you know, this is supposed to be for the priests, but at least if they were kept, then then it, it would probably be OK. And so David said, absolutely, they have been. And so he gave them bread and, and they, they were able to eat. Um, and so. Uh, verse five, and he said to them, the son of man is his Lord over the Sabbath. Now, this is an interesting thing. He brings up this story of David, which is a little bit different because David didn't. He didn't uh, um, harvest, but he took some of the bread that was that was meant the bread of the presence that was that was um, basically changed out every day. And what the the, the old stuff was was food for the priests, <clears throat> and um, so David wasn't harvesting. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But what the point it it appears that. Jesus is making here is this reference to the son of man could be a, 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 a little bit of a veiled reference to the son of David and, and his messiahship. And um, if the fact that he says the son of man is Lord over the Sabbath. Um, and so this, what Jesus seems to be indicating here is he is indicating that if David was able to do that, um, and it was and it was okay, then the son of David, the Messiah, the the greater son of David, the Messiah, is Lord over the Sabbath, and and can um, make these 
kinds of decisions. Um, and, it, and at one point in time, Jesus, I don't, I don't think it shows up here in Luke, but at one point in time, Jesus says that, um, that the Sabbath was, was made for man, man, not man for the Sabbath. Um, and, and so that idea of <clears throat> the Sabbath was not meant to tie us down on a bunch of rules and regulations. It was meant to provide rest and, and, um, replenishment and refreshment for for humanity it's the way god designed it but it had become this kind of uh, rule laden day that was almost exhausting in the sense of trying to keep all of the rules so that you weren't technically breaking the sabbath um and, and it, it had become more work <laughs> than it was restful and jesus says that in a in another, uh, I think it's in another gospel. I don't think it shows up here in, in Luke. Well, I guess we'll see as we go along. But um, <clears throat> so Jesus seems to be making a point about his messiahship here um, is what this is about. And this comment about the Son of Man being Lord over the Sabbath. Um, and so again, this next one, the uh, 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 same kind of thing. Luke's making this point about the Sabbath and in Jesus' messiahship and how it relates to the Sabbath and the law. And so verse six on another Sabbath, <clears throat> he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. What, what I think is time, often missed in this story um, is how cold and blind the Pharisees were to what God was up to and what God was doing. They were waiting for Jesus to heal, which should have been a sign um, that God was up to something that maybe we ought to take note that this, this Jesus is able to heal. <clears throat> we've witnessed it. We've seen it. Um, man, this is exciting. God is up to something. Maybe we ought to, maybe we ought to, uh, you know, be open to that, but no, they don't care about the fact that Jesus is able to heal. Now, People didn't just walk around healing people in those days. It just didn't happen, right? Uh, th but they treat it as so <clears throat> secondary. And this just goes to show how human beings, how we as humans can get so locked into um, in tunnel vision in terms of how God works and what God does that we can absolutely miss the movement of God right underneath our various our our, our noses, um, because we are so cold and closed to the fact that God could could do something different. And this goes along with what Jesus said before when we in in chapter five when he was talking about the new garments and the new new wine. This is exactly what he's talking about. God was up to, up to something new here. God was moving in a new and different way. And these guys were totally oblivious to it. At the fact that they didn't even acknowledge it just astonishes me in some ways. But yet, I see it in other ways. And <clears throat> in, in people missing, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of, of a church that um, their youth pastor was ultimately fired because there were too many non-Christian kids at youth group. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Isn't that what it's supposed to be about? Isn't that what church is about? Is about the mission of God? And yet they fire this youth pastor because there's too many non-Christians there. You need to just be ministering to the church kids. Oh my goodness, that is so pharisaical. That's exactly what's going on here. And I'm starting to get fired up because this, this is the kind of thing that just gets me worked up. Um, it, it just is, it's just so blatantly 
blind to what God is doing. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. They are sitting there, not intrigued, at least intrigued, by the reality that Jesus has the ability to heal. But they're watching him to see that he'll he that see if he'll heal this guy so that they can accuse him of, of doing a healing on the Sabbath. It's like they were so locked into their rules and regulations, and, and they just miss what God is doing. Um, it's just it's just tragic. Uh, and it's tragic when this happens. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've sat in another church where the conversation came up about um, uh, those who are ultimately, I guess, of the LGBTQ community. And the church, what do, how do we how do we receive them? And it was like we need we need to love them for who for who they are. They are made in the image of God. We need to love them and and trust that God's gonna work in their lives. And and um someone piped up and said, Well, we don't want them here. I'm like, what? We don't want them here. What is that all about? It, it just, we get so locked into how we think God is at work that we miss what God might be doing. Um, and we're afraid. I, I think it's out of fear. Um, and uh, so anyway, these, these Pharisees obviously operating, I believe, out of fear um, that that something was happening outside of the way that they had constructed their their faith and religion, um, and and so if anything happened outside of that, well, oh my goodness, we that that can't be can't be the hand of God. Verse eight, but he knew their thoughts, and how he knew their thoughts, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I think I think we can read people, you know. And, and I think we can just look at people and their posture and what their what their facial expressions, and we can we can pretty much figure out what they're thinking. Pretty much figure out, yeah, you know. Um, and I think Jesus did a lot of that. Was there maybe some times where he was given some special insight by the Holy Spirit? I mean, it's possible, yes. Um, but I think that that um, was no different than maybe what we get at times. The Spirit kind of gives us a, an indication uh, of some things. And so he he somehow knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come, stand here. And he rose and stood there. <clears throat> and Jesus said to them, them being the Pharisees, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? So Jesus is asking a question. And really his question is, it would be a good thing to heal this person. If I have the ability to heal, it would be a good thing to heal this person. So is it lawful to do good or to do harm? If I don't, is this this person's life is continuing to be altered and, and harmed essentially? It, 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 I can give life to this person, or I can allow his life to be continue to be destroyed because you know, and, the, and Luke makes the point it's the right hand, which was the most important hand. He probably wasn't able to work, he probably was not really able to do a whole lot. And so to restore his right hand would have been very life-giving. It would have been very good for this guy. And so Jesus asked them the question. And then, verse 10, after looking around at them, 
Obviously, they didn't respond. They didn't know what to say. But he gave them the opportunity to say something. He gave them the opportunity to instruct. He gave them the chance to basically say, no, this is the way you should do it. But Jesus had backed them into a corner. If they would have said, it's not lawful to do good, then it would have came back on them in a negative way. And so they didn't say anything. So the fact that they didn't say anything, he looked around at them, gave them opportunity. He said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did. And he did so. And his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury. Again, <clears throat> a man's hand was healed before your very eyes. His life is going to be dramatically altered as a result of this healing. He is going to now be a productive um, member of society. Um, he is more than likely overjoyed and they are filled with fury and discussed with one another that what they might do to Jesus. Oh, man, um, I don't want to go off on this again, but it just is, it's infuriating to me to see that kind of attitude. And, and unfortunately, that attitude still exists today. Um, and then we get to verse 12. And um, this is a passage that I referenced uh, yesterday in the sermon. It says, in these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. Um, and when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. So he chose from his disciples, from them, 12. So there were more than 12. We know there were, there were a lot of disciples, a lot of those who followed Jesus. But now he, he named them apostles. And the word apostle just means one that is sent or messenger. Um, and so then we have the list of apostles there. Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot. Um, sometimes he was called, um, wait, no, that's Judas, the son of James. I think Judas, the son of James, is sometimes called Thaddeus. Um, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Um, and right there, we, we have it right in the beginning. Um, and I think I, I mentioned this during the Easter season, um, that it, it, Judas Iscariot, it could, uh, there's a very good evidence that it's Judas, Judas of Kerioth, which would have been um, in Judah. Uh, so he was the, the only non-Galilean um, apostle uh, Judas was, <clears throat> which could have lended, if he was Judean, could have lended to his um, pushing for this nationalistic military um, leader that the Messiah would be. Um, so anyway, we'll talk more about that uh, at a later date. But uh, there it is of uh, up to verse 16. And now we, <clears throat> we have Jesus. And again, we have to be careful about chronology here. Uh, this event uh, in verse 12, <clears throat> when you go to a, a harmony of the Gospels, and in a harmony, what they'll do is they'll lay out the best that they can, the timeline, and when these things took place. In this moment, when Jesus went up to the mountain and he prayed all night long, uh, praying about who it would be, that he would appoint as apostles. Um, and uh, this event comes about um, 12 to 18 months into Jesus' public ministry. So it's very possible 
that these guys had been following him around for quite some time. And so he didn't just go up, you know, you read the book of Mark and, and right away before you get through the first chapter of Mark, Jesus is, you know, saying, I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you. Um, and, and, and that um, isn't really the way it happened. It, it, it happened in the sense of there was a relationship there. There was, there was some indicators by these guys that there, there was this desire for more. There was this, this kind of leaning into Jesus and his, and, and following him in, a, him in a way that they kind of, um, we use the term popcorn. And we used to use that term with, with uh, students in student ministry. You're looking for those students who kind of popcorn, those students who really, they want more. They're, they're beginning to ask more questions. They're beginning to, to be more concerned about the, the spiritual well-being of not just themselves, but maybe their peers, their friends, and they're wanting to um, they're wanting to uh, um, make uh, they're wanting to engage in spiritual conversation. They're wanting to get involved in ministering to their peers, and, and they're wanting to get involved and get their hands in doing doing ministry and and that's that's this idea of kind of popcorning and those are this those are the students that we used to go okay let's let's take these students and let's um let's begin what's called a ministry team and this is where we see Jesus beginning his ministry team and and the the idea that he chose 12 um was very um, indicative of his mission as the Messiah. And it wouldn't have been lost on those folks. Twelve disciples, twelve tribes of Israel. This is all what it's part, this is all part and parcel to what they what they saw um, the Messiah being about and doing and kind of um, reestablishing Israel again and the 12 tribes, the gathering of the 12 tribes. Now it just happened obviously in a much different way. <clears throat> than they were thinking, um, but nonetheless, that's what is going on here with the the twelve disciples. All right, let me uh, let me pray, and um, we'll we'll sign off for the day. And Lord willing, we'll pick up here tomorrow, and we're going to look at Luke's version of the the Sermon on the Mount. And this is really called the Sermon on the Plain, and some. In some uh, references, maybe in your your um, Bible, there's a heading there. It says Sermon on the Plain. I think it's in Luke where it's recorded as such. But anyway, um, let's uh, let's pray. Father God, thank you for um, today. Thank you for this important reminder in your word that um, sensitivity to your spirit and what you're up to is way more important than following a set of man-made rules that limit your activity and, and how you work in, in, in the world. God, help us not to be there. Help us not to miss what you're up to because we're so locked into um, the, the box that we've put you in. Um, but uh, God, blow, blow up our boxes and... Um, Lord, blow up our boxes and uh, and uh, help us to see what you're up to, that we can join in uh, and be a part of it. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I've got uh, my phone ringing and all kinds of stuff going on here. So I'm going to let you go. And... Um, I'm going to say, Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow and look at the sermon, uh, Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. But until then, um, God bless, uh, be well, be safe, and be a blessing to someone today. <laughs>